the program today has just been uh, exceptional. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really moved. The last bunch of speakers were just, I got myself all charged up. But you know, we all come at this work from different directions and in different ways. And um, many of you have heard me speak here in Calgary over the last couple of days. And I thought I would actually do something a little bit different um, than what you've been hearing me talk about so far. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to this work. I was raised by a single father in the 70s who was a hippie. I was raised, born and raised, a hippie child. They used to call me, and they used to call my sister and I, the dirty girls, because we really didn't bathe all that much. And being raised by a hippie in the 70s provided us with all sorts of incredible challenges. You can imagine that being raised by a musician, uh, there wasn't a lot of money. Uh, in fact, uh, money was something that we, we really, my father used to laugh, that we're vegetarians, not because we don't have a pro we have a problem with meat, but because we simply don't have the money for beef. Um, and, you know, it was hard. I was the oldest daughter of two uh, children. My father was raising my sister and I from the time I was four years old. And I was the one really doing a lot of the caregiving for my little sister. Um, it, we spent a lot of time alone. We spent a lot of time having to make do. And we spent a lot of time uh, with a lot more freedom than the average kid gets. It's an interesting thing. Um, lots of people, when I look back, I think about the hardship that we had. The uh, experiences that we had were really not like a typical family. But you know, what we lacked in money, we made up for in love. My father was the most incredibly loving man you could ever imagine. And what we lacked in discipline, because there was none, <laughs> we made up for in initiative. My sister and I got into more trouble, more activities than you can possibly imagine. It was really funny because ultimately, my father wrote a letter to me uh, last week. And in the letter he said, you know, dear, you can do anything you want in this world. You've always been able to do anything that you want. And you know, it's funny because that's how we were raised, with this sense of possibility, this sense of potential, this ability to, to imagine, to dream. He used to say, you know, anything that you can imagine, you can make happen. Anything that you want in the world can be yours. And you know, along that world, it never occurred to me to ask permission. It was just, per it was just possibility. We had the ability to do it all. So it was quite a shock when I left home and I was faced with the real world and walking into uh, school and moving into a place where I was wanting to find a way to, to find my place in the world. What was fascinating was I knew from a very early age that I wanted to be doing something good in the world. I wanted to be part of the solution. I was really shocked to discover that the not-for-profit world, which is where I thought all the solutions providers were, was actually really, um, I felt, in a place where it was reinventing the world, re reinventing the wheel over and over again. So I got my degree in environmental studies and international development, and I went on to try to work in uh, the not-for-profit sector. I had an incredible privilege to be able to work at an organization called Web Networks, where during the dot-com boom and bust, and that's a place where I had a, uh, the opportunity to help build websites for probably 100 not-for-profit organizations and charities. And what was astounding to me was just how we kept doing the same thing over and over and over again. The websites were the same, the requirements were the same, the challenges were the same, and it was just so clear that the capacity of the not-for-profit sector was so low, and I became enraged. Just enraged. Because here were the people that cared the most about the world. The ones who had dedicated their lives and committed themselves to this very important work. And here we were, and we couldn't figure out how to do the most basic things. And I found this infuriating. And it started an important uh, thought process for me. It started with this question of coordinated voice. Today we heard about all the reasons why we need to have a voice. But being alone in that voice is so very alone. And the question is, how do we actually 
create a coordinated voice? How do we bring those voices together? And so I started to ask the question, how do we share? How do we figure out how to collaborate? How do we bring the assets that we each bring, the strategic directions that we're each going, and how do we realign these things so that we can actually be effective? And that has been the challenge that I've put myself, I've put in front of myself for the last 15 or 20 years. Ultimately, it's about collaboration. And so I want to share with you a story of one of my experiments in collaboration. I've had many along the way, but the one that I think most of you are all interested in is the work that we do at the Center for Social Innovation. It started with this simple question, how do we get 14 organizations to share space? It's not a big deal, let's just share an office. Not such a big deal. Offices might have a photocopier, we could share a kitchen, maybe we can share some meeting rooms, what a concept. When we went into this idea, there were so many people who said, oh my gosh, no, really, there's so many competitors in that space. You know, what if they compete with each other? How will they feel? Will they be able to actually not backstab each other? And, and you know, it was a legitimate question, actually, at the time. But in fact, uh, in 2004, when we created the space, we set about this challenge, and we actually proved that, in fact, huh, turns out it's not so hard. Sharing's pretty easy. And we got pretty excited. In 2007, we had an opportunity to expand. And we uh, found another 13,000 square feet on the fourth floor of the building that we were renting. And we started to ask the question, maybe, maybe there's more than just sharing. Maybe we could actually connect each other and animate our community and build connection and build relationship. And maybe something spectacular will happen when we start to bring together the component parts. What kind of magic, what kind of synergy, what kind of outcomes might emerge if we put 175 organizations that are trying to change the world into the same space? At that stage, we started a huge transformation in our own organization where we realized that it's not just nonprofits that are working to change the world. In fact, it's an incredible community of people from across the for-profit, nonprofit sector that are finding different ways to be part of the solution. And in fact, that focus on solutions became so clear to us that in fact what we wanted to do is we wanted to curate, we wanted to bring together not just anyone in a shared space, but we wanted to bring together people who had at their core a focus on rethinking our world. A commit, those who had and shared a commitment to solutions. So today we've heard about all the things that are so challenging and so wrong in the world and all the things that we need to do to get our act together to make the world a better place. And I'm going to suggest to you that an important thread in that is those people who are using their skills, their talents, their design, their creativity to actually start reinventing the world one project at a time. And that's what we're doing at the center. And I want to share a couple stories about the kinds of organizations that we have in the space because I couldn't be more proud of the folks and the amazing social innovators who have committed their lives to finding ways to get past and through this brokenness of our system to actually co-create solutions. I could tell you a thousand, well, I could tell you actually 350 stories, but um, I'll tell you one or two. There's an organization that I find just astounding. They're called Canopy. And what Canopy does is they're involved, how many people have heard of Canopy? Okay, good, so if I get it wrong, you can correct me. Uh, Canopy, what amazes me about Canopy is what they're focused on is on changing the way that the printing industry engages uh, in the marketplace to move towards sustainable forests. Now what they do is they don't yell and scream about what's wrong in the world. They go to the publishing industry and they convince the publishing industry to print the Canadian version of Harry Potter 7 on sustainable harvested wood. Phenomenal. What they're just doing right now is they are publishing the first book ever. Margaret Atwood's first hundred copies of her new book will be published on straw. This to me is market transformation in action. It's about taking our creativity, our ability to collaborate, and focusing on how we are co-creating solutions for a better world. I'll tell you another story. Not far from the tree, who's heard of them? 
Oh good, I get to share. <laughs> Uh, Not Far From the Tree is an amazing charitable organization. It's composed of over 750 volunteers in the GTA. And you know what they do? They have identified and located the fruit trees across the GTA, and they have har um, recruited 750 volunteers to go and harvest the fruit that would otherwise lie on the ground. And they take that fruit, and they divide it three ways. One third of that fruit goes to the volunteer who picked it, so at least you get to go home with some goodies. The second third goes to the homeowner, uh, which is uh, unable or, uh, or unwilling to harvest that fruit. And the third, and I think this is very important, the third third, uh, the last third of the fruit goes to the food bank to be able to reinvest and go back into our local community. The list goes on. Goodfoot Delivery, another member of our community that employs um, uh, developmentally disabled uh, people to be uh, delivering the courier packages in our community. Ultimately, what these folks have in common is that they're fundamentally rethinking the way that we solve these challenges that we're facing. And our collective, our ability to unite all of these different entrepreneurs and to start to coalesce that energy um, so that it's not just one-off organizations moving this forward, but rather it's about building a movement of organizations and people who are rethinking the way that they do things and that they're actually starting to reimagine those systems that have, we have been, that have been holding us back. So CSI talks very much about I mean, for us, the core is who we're bringing into that space, who we're curating into that space. But the second really important area here is what I call uh, the opportunity to create collisions. At CSI, our entire space, our entire ethos is about creating collisions. Now you say that sounds very disruptive, but in fact that's exactly what it is. What we're doing, if you go into a typical office space, we actually have all these lovely walls and we have all these barriers around us and we have these big giant hallways and you know, you can not meet people easily, right? It's quite quite effective. At CSI what we do is we actually design the space in such a way that we actually force you to intersect with one another. And that intersection happens because they're uh, because of the way the meeting rooms are designed, because of the way that the spaces are designed but it's also where we put the coffee maker. It's also about how we are um, engaging with folks through our programming. So what we're in the business of doing is community animation. We look at how do we convene? How do we convene to build collaboration? That manifests itself in peer networking circles. It manifests itself in online mailing lists that are faster than lightning at doing triage for social entrepreneurs. It manifests itself in how we're building collaborative efforts, how we're supporting startups, social startups. Ultimately, the Center for Social Innovation is geared to and looking at how do we create opportunities for meeting places where we can have individuals connecting with each other, sparking new ideas, and then building collaboration to be able to coordinate our voices so that we might have the opportunity to be more effective in what we do and say together. Fundamental to what we're about is about possibility. And I guess this brings me back a little bit to my dad. You know, ultimately, I never really thought to ask permission. And when I meet people, I'm astounded by how many people f seem to be waiting and expecting that somebody else is going to do it for them. I'm here to grant you permission. My dad never granted me permission, didn't even occur to me, but if you feel that you're waiting for someone or something to say it's okay to be a part of the solution, I'm going to do it for you right here and right now. We're, we have all of the potential in the world. Ultimately, it's about believing in ourselves, and it's about believing in each other. So another piece of CSI that I think is really important to share is that we're not such, uh, we're not so completely ideological that we don't look at our own need to identify self-interest and to figure out how to work with that. 50% of our members at CSI are actually organizations that are running for-profit businesses and are very, very focused on their bottom line. 
And all the other half, the nonprofits and charities, are also actually uh, focused on their bottom line uh, among that social mission. One of the things that we've learned at CSI and that I invite you to take and adapt in your own work is we actually believe in the power of self-interest. Now that's something that may not resonate with all of you here today, but I'm just going to say to you, think about this. What if we were to be honest about our self-interest? What if we were to reveal our needs? What if we were to build trust with others in that self-interest and then look, not try to hide that self-interest, but actually reveal it and look at how we have the opportunity to align our self-interest with others for con to look for converging interests, which would ultimately lead to collective benefit. That's what we're focused on. How do we recognize and harness the power of that self-interest, bring those self-interests together, align those self-interests for collective benefit? This is where the possibility exists. This is where we're seeing collaborations emerge. This is where we're seeing energy and momentum. And this is where we're seeing new solutions being generated every single day. So I share the story with you not because you need a CSI in Calgary, although you may, but because these ideas are ideas that can inform every one of your decisions. They're ideas that I hope will inform the way that you work with each other, the way that you build collaboration with your partners and with your non-partners, the way that you look and see that actually maybe your partners are not the people you thought they were, but are actually the unusual suspects where those opportunities and those self-interests align. So when you look at who, who could you collaborate with, take a look at your whole ecosystem and look at where are those converging spaces. Ultimately, I'm in this business and I'm doing this work for one reason only. Over the last 20 years working in the not-for-profit sector, I feel so deeply and so strongly that the only way that we're going to change the world is by working together. And I'm here to tell you that you and we have all of the potential in the world to make this happen. And I hope that you will take this into your work absolutely every single day because my God, people, we got a lot of work to do. Thank you. <laughs>